Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video episode on the Forgotten Weapons Library. It's been a little while since we did a video review, but the book we've got today definitely calls for one. And that book is the M1 Garand Rifle. This is a very new book by Bruce Canfield. Um, certainly if you are into books on American martial weapons, you'll have heard of Mr. Canfield. Um, and this particular book really is kind of the, the be-all and end-all of references on the M1, I think. Um, I'll be honest, I actually don't have all that much on the M1 in my own library right now. I've, yeah, I've read, or read through a lot of the other books, uh, a lot of the books that are out there owned by friends of mine, and I've been kind of putting off getting my own book. Um, and frankly, I'm glad I waited because this particular one really is, is the only one you're going to need. This thing is huge. This is just under 900 pages, and it does this a really awesome job of covering really everything you could want to know about the M1. So let's go ahead and take a look through and you can get a feel for just what you're getting with a copy of this book. All right, so let's take a look inside. Like I said, this thing is about 900 pages and so I'm gonna have to skip over a fair amount just to go through in a reasonable time. Uh, however, the book begins with a significant section on other self-loading rifles that the U.S. was looking into uh, before World War II around through the period where the M1 was being developed. So we have some, some notable early ones, some of you folks may recognize, like the Bomarito. Um, this then moves into um, also, of course, early versions of the M1, dating all the way back to the 1919 model. Um, of course, Garand went through quite a lot of different variations of the rifle before he ended up with the perfected version we know about today. Um, and of course, a lot of coverage of the, the various uh, sequential testing, uh, testing boards that were uh, used to evaluate different self-loading rifles at the time. Now, once we get, you can see, we've got over 100 pages on early development before the M1 is actually accepted as the M1, which is really cool. Um, I find some of that information to be some of the most interesting, you know, the the rifles that could have been but weren't. So now we have early uh, tooling up to produce the M1, um, a good section discussing the gas trap, uh, how that was uh, originally set up and then replaced and what, what came of it. There's an entire chapter on Melvin Johnson and his Johnson uh, automatic rifle that was intended, he, he really hoped it would complement the M1 and also be selected as a, a US service rifle, although it wasn't. Um, also a section on Pedersen. Pet there's uh, more on Pedersen earlier on uh, with Pedersen's semi-automatic rifle, uh, but then some more work that he did. Uh, next chapter here is on Winchester getting into the business of making M1s and some of their learning curve. Uh, Winchester also had a number of other projects that they put on the table, which we will get to in a minute. Uh, Springfield, production early in the war, whole chapter on that. Uh, just an interesting uh, little side note here, some discussion of the seventh round stoppage, um, what it was, how it was fixed, discussion of uh, the magazines, or the, the clips rather, why the eight round in block clip was chosen rather than box magazines, which were obviously well known at the time. Uh, here's one of Winchester's other projects that I mentioned, the G30R, um, which not entirely. So, one of Winchester's other projects, like I mentioned, the G30R, um, uh, another self-loading rifle to compete with the M1. Didn't end up going anywhere. Um, section on some foreign military rifles and then also experimental versions of the M1. This, of course, is the, the Japanese Type 5 or Type 4 was basically a copy of the M1. And then we have a whole section on the E series. So the M1, E1, E2, E3, etc. Uh, all the, the prototype variants of the M1 that were toyed with. Uh, we have research and development after the war. So this is basically the developmental history of the M14. Um, and when that didn't pan out as quickly as they thought, uh, the military had to go back to producing more M1s, including some, ex some more experimental stuff there. Let's see. Moving on, we also have the T-Series. These are, um, again, some of the experimental rifles uh, in the build-up to the M14. 
uh, once the M1 is no longer a military issue weapon, of course, we have the issue of uh, surplusing and demilling and what was involved in that, what, was ha what happened, what was done, um, what rifles were saved and what weren't. Starting to skip over more here to get through this before we have a really long video. Um, there is, of course, a rather significant section at the end on accessories, things like ammunition, uh, bandoliers, bayonets, grenade launchers, cartridge belts, you name it, it is all in here. Uh, there's some, some on grenades, slings. One of the really cool parts, something you don't find very often, um, the section on components goes through basically every single individual component part of the rifle. Let's skip past the receiver here to something else. Like, say, this guy goes through the different drawing numbers and the changes and how to identify which version of a particular part you might have. So for the really, uh, shall we say, detail-oriented historian or collector, this is an invaluable section. Um, you know, these drawing numbers are marked on many of the parts, although not always. And this is an outstanding reference for being able to identify uh, what parts are in a rifle. And of course, by the very end, there are a number of tables of serial numbers, including, um, this is some relatively common information, but serial numbers by date of production, which is a nice, handy thing to have. And there are some other uh, little bit more esoteric tables back here. Um, National Match Rifle serial numbers, Sniper Rifle serial numbers. There's a list of the verified serial numbers of the E-Series experimental guns. So definitely some cool information in there. All right, so there you go. Information on every phase of the existence of the M1 rifle from before it was actually designed up to right at the present day. Um, you notice there's a photo in there of some Syrian rebels uh, in 2012 with an M1. Uh, it doesn't get a whole lot newer than that. So anyway, uh, cover price on this book is a bit hefty at $96. Uh, although frankly, I think for the amount of material in it, it's a price well worth paying. Um, certainly it's cheaper than going out and buying several other reference books and it covers pretty much everything by itself. So also helps, you can get one on Amazon for about 15 bucks less right now, brand new. So uh, get yourself over. If you don't have a book on the M1 or even if you do, uh, this will replace it in your library, I think. Uh, excellent book to have, excellent rifle. I think you'll enjoy it. Thanks for watching, guys.